Good evening. I pray you're well and staying safe. We are continuing with our, our daily Bible study. Today is Wednesday, June 3rd, 2020. Um, we are still in the book of John. We are in chapter 16, verse 15 through 23. So I will ask you to pause the video here to go get your Bibles. If you do not have a Bible at home, the link for the gospel reading for today is in the same email as this video. So, as it is always best before we read the Bible every day, we should say a prayer before we read the Bible. Any prayer will do, the Our Father, whatever prayer is comfortable for you. I like to read, and I've been reading this prayer, which is the prayer we read before I read the Gospel and the Divine Liturgy. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Shine in our hearts, O Master who loves mankind the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind that we may comprehend the proclamations of your Gospels. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having trampled down all carnal desires, we may lead a spiritual life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory, together with your Father, who is without beginning, and you all hold the good and life, creating spirit, now and forever to the ages of ages. Amen. So, let me begin. Again, we are in the book of John, Chapter 16, verse 15 through 23. All things that the Father has are, are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful. But your sorrow will turn, be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So... Firstly, let me just recap kind of where we're at. So yesterday's gospel reading and the last couple, we've been kind of in the same time period. We are, or Jesus is now uh, on his way from the upper room where the last supper took place in Bethany over to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is across the Kidron Valley. And I'm going to read about, more about that tomorrow. or next, Actually, a um, couple more weeks, I think. And then... Uh, so basically, the route from the upper room to Gethsemane, if it's a straight line, is just under a mile. But you can't go that way, right? You have to kind of go down into the valley or follow the outskirts of the wall of the city. And that's probably the route they took to get to this garden. And they had to cross a small brook uh, to get to this garden. So this way, this, this path is probably between uh, a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half. Right? So how long does it take to walk a mile with a group of 12 people, right? Or maybe now 11, maybe even more, right? Um, so how long does it take to walk? If you're doing a brisk walk, maybe like a, a nine or maybe a 12 minute mile, 12 minutes, but it could have taken a little longer. And, he's, and so this discourse I mean, is on the way there. So they might have been stopped. They might have been gathered a little bit. They're stopping to ask questions. Hey, what is he saying here? So I just want to kind of give you a kind of a background of what the scene looks like, right? They're walking. So the first thing I want to point out is Jesus says here, okay, and it opens like this, all things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. This is part of yesterday's reading, right? I'm just going to go back a little bit. Um, I still have many things. This is verse 12. I'm going back. I just want to kind of tie this together. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. This is all about the Spirit now, the Holy Spirit. For he will take of he will take of, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So it opens this. So this statement here is a reminder <coughs> by John <coughs> where exactly we're at. So all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So he's speaking about the Holy Spirit here. Okay? Keep that in mind. He's speaking about the Holy Spirit because whatever the Father has, Jesus has. Whatever Jesus has, the Father has. It's all shared. It's all the same. Right? Omus is all the same in one essence. So the Spirit will bring them what the Father from the Father and from the Son. So that's what he's talking about. And what is it exactly that the Father and the Son um, share? Okay, what is it that, the, that belongs to the Father that also belongs to Christ? First of all, the Son and the Father possess the same divine nature. Okay? So the same divine nature that the Father possesses, the Son also possesses, right? So they, they, share, they share the same divine nature, essence, homoousios. We know that right? in the Creed, and I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, right? Uh, the only begotten Son, who is of one essence with the Father. That's the same divine nature. The same divine perfection that belongs to one belongs to the other. Right? So the nature and the, the perfect nature, they, they're the same. All right? And the Son shares in the same glory as the Father. Right? And Christ does not mention these things. Okay? Uh, what, the, what these actual things are that, that belong to the Father. Because he doesn't need to. He only mentions, he mentions that what belongs to him because whatever belongs to him belongs to the Father, whatever belongs to the Father belongs to him. Okay? So there's no reason for Christ to mention what these things are. Okay? Because they belong to both. Both the Father and the Son are equally concerned with everything relating to the, to the salvation, to the benefit, to the comfort, and to the happiness or joy of all of us. And especially in this gospel, in the gospel re reading, especially to the disciples, right? So God the Father, God the Son are concerned with the same things, with the salvation, of the comfort, right? Of the joy, all right? Protection, all these things, they share in all that. So when the Spirit of God comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, He doesn't just take something from the Father and something different from the Son. Whatever he takes from the Father, he's taking from the Son. Whatever he takes from the Son, he's taking from the Father. Because they share everything. So the Spirit of God comes down this Sunday on Pentecost, right? And comes down, he shares both what the Father and the Son share. See, so, this, so this whole, this is this, now John's vision of the, of the Holy Trinity. So, Jesus, in this John, on this reading, the lectionary opens with that to remind us that the Trinity is of one essence, right? So we have verse 16 really is what this discourse is doing now because it seems like a very broken thing. What the beginning 15 is from yesterday's, but it, one, it links to today. But this is really the, the begin, this is really what today is about. So in verse 16 it's very important. A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. So we know what John is talking about. Right? Um, so, first, this little while to the next little while, all right, is Jesus speaking in between um, his death and most likely Pentecost. Okay? We could say his resurrection, but, and, he, and he, does, he speaks to them after his resurrection for 40 days, but it's really, you know, to see, and it, it, there's two different words in the Greek. One is really like seeing, one is really beholding understanding, right? So that's why you can kind of infer that uh, this time period that Jesus is speaking about, this little while to little while, is between his crucifixion and Pentecost. Now, when Jesus says to them, in a little, in a little while you will not see me, <clears throat> he's talking about, obviously, for us anyway, he's talking about his crucifixion. 
he's spoken to them about this, what's going to happen to him, all right? But it hasn't happened. And they're not entirely convinced it hasn't happened, right? So after he says this, in a very little time after he says this, right? And after saying a prayer for them, which, which will be read the next couple of days, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas, with a group of men, a band of you know soldiers basically, captured Jesus, arrested him, and brought him to Pilate and to, to Caiaphas and to, to condemn him and convict him and crucify him. So this is a very little short time. This is the evening before. It's right after the Passover meal. It's early, probably most likely early in the morning, and Jesus is captured and brought to his trial and, and, and convicted and uh, crucified. But it's not too long after that, right, three days, that the resurrection happens. And so what you have is, and it's, it, again, it's, it's Jesus speaking to them very clearly, okay? Look, in a little while, now that can be any amount of time, but if you say to someone in a little while, it could be a few hours, maybe a little more than a day, maybe. In a little while, you're not going to see me. Meaning I'm going to be taken away from you. He's already announced the betrayal of Judas. He's already announced to them what's going to happen when he goes to Jerusalem. He's already announced that they're going to kill him. He's even told them they're going to be killed. So they, they've, got, they've, they've got an understanding of what's going to happen, but it still hasn't happened. They, again, they have this understanding of what's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So it's not completely sinks in. It's not until Gethsemane where they start to scatter. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell them as well. Look, you're not going to see me. You're going to take off. You're going to be so scared. Right? And I'm going to die, and you will be filled with sorrow, great sorrow. And that brings me to the next, to the next kind of the next question here. Right? He knows, if, let me just read this first. So you understand a little better. Jesus knows that, that they're asking, what is he saying this little while and this little while here? He says to them, most surely I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. It's that idea now that the, the disciples are hearing what Jesus is saying. He's going to say, look, What's going to happen is now, he doesn't even tell them about the crucifixion. He said, look, what's going to happen next is, you, I'm going to disappear from you. And you'll be filled with great sorrow. You will be so upset, so troubled. Not because this is before the crucifixion. They're going to know what happened. He was captured. They're going to run in fear. They're going to hide in fear. They're going to be at the at far away watching him die. And they will be filled with so much pain. Okay? So Jesus, for some reason now, and I want to just I want to do a little side note for a second, but he uses the image of a pregnant woman. And I just want to read this here. Okay? A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she does, or she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. All right? So... I want to say this a little side note. We've noticed that when we're reading that Jesus tends to use things that are around him in his surroundings to, to use them as an image to make an example or an, uh, uh, an, alo um, an analogy for what he's trying to teach. We don't, as of some of the things I've read, there's no evidence anywhere to suggest that there was a pregnant woman or woman in labor walking with him. We have to assume that there's no woman in, because he specifically say a woman in labor about to give birth, the, the very bad childbirth pains, right? So, and I, we can probably infer that Jesus really is talking about the curse, right? Or the, that the, the God put on Eve when we were expelled from the garden that she will have pains in childbirth. And it's a very beautiful image by John here, right? So John is using what Jesus has said, all right, about these pains, right, 
So this is just so again this is a little side note because there's two things happening. Jesus is using the image for to show them what their feelings are going to be like. This great sorrow and how it's going to turn into great joy with the resurrection. John, I think, is pulling that out more to remind us back of this the pains of childbirth that were given to Eve because we're expelled from the garden. But now with Jesus Christ, we have joy. So although we still are born, uh, a woman gives birth in pain. All right? There's the joy of the resurrection. Okay? And uh, that we have anyway. So the woman, we even know before that. But again, what Jesus is trying to say here is other, and I'm just, I'm kind of pointing that out because that's what I think. It, it seems to be like that, right? Um, Jesus is pointing, uh, Jesus is saying to them, look, the same pain, because when he says sorrow, he means pain, deep pain. And the woman has physical, very bad physical pain when she gives, child, uh, gives birth, is in labor, right? Um, so he said, you're going to have the same pain, but after, he says, when the baby's born, those pains are immediately forgotten. You know, um, and that for that moment, when the mother holds the child for the first time, the joy is so incredible. And the, the reason why, is because that's the joy of heaven. And it's a very fleeting moment for us. But it, and, it, and it comes back, always back into your life when you have children, in and out, in and out. But that real, that, that joy that moment of joy, that's what Jesus is saying to them. Look, you're going to feel the great pain of a woman in labor when you see me on the cross. When you see me arrested and whipped and beaten, you will, you will feel that your sorrow will feel that much pain. But at the same time, when you see me after my resurrection, the joy will be just as intense and it will last all the way until the Holy Spirit comes down on them and then the joy is sealed in them. So that's why Jesus is using that image of the pregnant woman and the other, of course, always that Jesus does is to comfort them. Look, you're going to be in a lot of pain, but I promise you there will be great joy after this. So Jesus is always comforting those that he loves. Okay? So, do the disciples understand what Jesus is talking? I'm going to say no, not entirely. And, and the reason is, look, we know the resurrected Christ. We know him. Because we don't know Christ before he's resurrected. We only know the resurrection of Christ. We've heard about the stories about Christ before. We know his life. And that's the difference between us and the disciples. Okay? At this point, they know the resurrected Christ too, but it we're looking at this. The disciples at this point, although they understand to some level, to some degree, it's not completely uh, understood. It's not entirely understood. And, and there's still this, this level of humanity, that, this imperfection that they have in their humanity, in their limited understanding, right? They don't know, they do not know yet. They do not know yet the resurrected Christ. They have not yet felt that joy. The same joy we feel every year when we yell Christos Anesti, although this year was a lot less joyful, right? But it was still there. Because we know the joy comes from the resurrection. The disciples here are limited to what they can understand because they have not yet experienced resurrection, nor have they been illumined by the Holy Spirit yet. Okay? So... Although, at this point, the disciples, we know the resurrected Christ, we're looking back at this, but they did not know the resurrected Christ. So, they did not entirely know what Jesus was talking about. And I wanted to just bring that out for a moment, because I, I just thought that was important to kind of just put into perspective where the heads of the disciples are, why they're asking these questions. And so now, there is another way that Jesus comforts his disciples, Okay. And I'm going to say it's the very last verse, verse 23 in this reading, which says this. And in that day you will ask me nothing, being in the resurrection. 
after he's resurrected. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. So what he's saying to them, look, they didn't know what he meant in verse 16, right? A little while, I'm going away a little while, I'm coming back. They had no idea. They were asking themselves, what is he talking about? And Jesus said, okay, you, this is what, I know you see what you're asking. Let me give you the answer. And he said, look, this, and you're in deep sorrow, so maybe you're afraid to ask me. But in, even in the great joy when I'm resurrected, you're not going to ask me anything. But what I'm trying to say to you, look, you can ask me. Anything you ask of God in my name, he's going to give you. Especially the disciples, right? So he, when he asks, when they ask themselves the question, okay, what is Jesus talking about here a little while, a little while? Jesus already demonstrates to them by saying, look, I know you're trying to ask me this question. Let me answer it for you. He's demonstrating two things. He knows what's in our hearts and what's in our minds. Okay? So he, he's demonstrating that he knows who we are and where we're coming from. And he knows, look, even from that point, he knows, look, they're not going to ask me anything. And he says, let me, I'm going to comfort them. He says, look, I know that at this point you're filled with sorrow and great trouble and it's going to get worse and you'll feel the joy and the resurrect, but you're not going to ask me anything then either. So please, listen to me. Ask the Father for what you need. And in my name, he'll give it to you. And this is the great comfort of this passage. And I'm really highlighting or underlying underlining this, this, this idea of comfort. Okay? Jesus is the same as God. He's almost just, he's one essence with God, the Father, right? The Holy Spirit shares and takes from both because they share everything. So take, when the Holy Spirit takes from one, he's taking from the other. Just, that's just the way it is. So that's a comfort that the Father and the Son are united because this is the comfort that God, our Creator, who loves us, now has become one of us to tell us that he loves us. And God, Christ is the manifestation of that love in this world, like I mentioned yesterday. Okay? And the Holy Spirit, when that comfort goes back with the Father, another comforter comes. So the Spirit of God, the Father, and the Spirit of Christ are, are here with us always. So the Spirit brings with it whatever is from God and whatever is from Christ because everything they share, everything. Okay? So then the Holy Spirit shares the same thing because he takes from them. So now, again, there's a, a very mystery, a mystical thing about this and, and the words I'm using are not really adequate to really describe what's really happening. No words are. The comfort of Jesus Christ is what we look for. The comfort of God, his love, and the strength and the grace from the Holy Spirit. These are terrible times we live in. As a matter of fact, since Adam and Eve fell, we've been in terrible times. This world that we live in is, is, is although not ruled by the, the devil anymore, he's still, and he has no hold over us with death, but he still tries to keep us from God. The comfort is this, that with God, anything we ask of him through Jesus Christ, I mean real things, not to win the lotto or to get a new car. I mean, I'm talking about spiritual things to keep me from being prideful, to keep me from being gluttonous, to, to help me in my sin, to lift me from my sin, to take up my cross, to take it from me and give me strength to go through whatever I have to go through, to live through this world until I can finally be with you in all your love. So, this is probably, in, in my estimation right now, this little passage is focusing more and more in on how much God loves us through the comfort of Jesus Christ. And because he knows he's leaving, but he knows, look, you're going you're to be fine, and you're going to be so joyful, and I will send someone to keep that joy with you. 
May God bless you. May you have a beautiful evening. And remember, God loves us all. Have a good evening. Good night.